Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, more library controversy. Also, who's in and who's out in District 2? And the Cannabis Commission, it reeks. Yeah, that's what I call a campfire. That smell, it's not just skunk weed. All this and much, much more coming up next on The V. Welcome to the voice of Alabama politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and as always, I'm joined by Susan Britt, research guru extraordinaire, and today, Charlie Walker, assistant to the editors at APR, and once upon a time, a New York Times freelancer. Yes, I did. But I am very glad to be back. Thank you all for having me. Welcome, yeah. welcome. Thank yeah, you. We're glad to have you back. You know, the race for the 2nd Congressional District is heating up already. And I mean, Susan, it's like a 10-car pileup. We've got so many candidates coming into the race. I mean, it's it's crowded. Yeah, we were, as you were preparing the, the script for the show, the agenda, that you had to keep adding candidates and adding candidates because yeah. they were just dropping in. Yeah. I mean, Stephen Reed not running opened the door wide open. I mean, Stephen Reed is is doing a great job mm -hmm. as a mayor by all accounts. And, uh, you know. No, absolutely. I think it's kind of nice that he's not running and leaving that door open for other people to have that opportunity. Yeah. So we can, you know, get to know more people and hopefully get some good, you know, expansion and work happening here finally. Yeah. I mean, the Reed machine, the Joe Reed mm -hmm. machine, Stephen Reed machine is behind Kurt Hatcher. Mm -hmm. Great guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he would do a great job. I mean, he's got a long history there, uh, and uh, that's going to be formidable. He's also going to face uh, Napoleon Bracey mm -hmm. and Anthony Daniels, and we'll get to those a little bit individual. But Bracey, very popular guy. Very popular. Everybody loves Napoleon Bracey. He's been, you know, done some really good work in the house. And, and He's, you know, everybody likes him. And he's got the bow tie. He does. He does. Wear. You got to love the bow tie. Yeah. I love a man with a bow tie. He does a great job. But then it's going to be formidable to overcome Anthony Daniels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though he is lives in the Huntsville, Madison area, his family is from Bullock County. Mm -hmm. Family goes back a long, long way. Mother is an extremely popular, grandmother, extremely mm -hmm. popular mm -hmm. figure there. And he can raise a lot of money. He can raise a lot of money, and he's got a lot of experience as, you know, minority leader of the House. He's been doing deals across the aisle for years with these guys, so he would actually hit the ground running, I think, in D.C. because he already knows, you know, what the processes are and, and, and how to work those in, in the right direction. Well, the thing yeah. is, he's worked the big donors all yes, these yeah, years. He, he has that name recognition. And I think that, like, when per, me personally, when I think of the Alabama Democratic Party, the two names that I think of that most represent it are Daniels and Sewell. Yeah. Like they are the most outspoken. They do the most for the party. Yeah. So it kind of makes sense to me that he, you know, is there. I just yeah. hate to lose him in Alabama. He's been such, he's, he's done so much good work in Alabama. Yeah. That's that the I biggest just, setback for me. I hate, I'd like to see him succeed at this. I'll say that. I would like to, I, don't I, would, I, would, I feel better. It, I would feel better him going, knowing we're getting someone else just as good. Yeah. But, but that's not he, always the case. Sewell, Katie Britt up there in D.C., man, they could get some Good work done for Alabama. Well, and I think, uh, you know, it, 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 another candidate that's thrown his head in is uh, Jeremy Gray. Mm -hmm. He's a very popular figure. Uh, he's uh, the majority minority whip, mm -hmm. uh, already experiencing some power. But I think the, the hard task is going to be how do you get around Daniels, his fundraising machine, and BCA has backed him in the past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You get the business community loves Anthony Daniels. I mean, that's a huge thing. 
But again, you got the Reed machine. So you do. You it's going to be interesting. And that Reed machine that has go. got a lot of powerful money. It's got a lot of powerful people in it. Yeah. Uh, and they they do turn out for their candidate. It, they they really do. I just I just have a feeling about Anthony in that position. But well, but I'm glad so many people are running, so we have a lot of options. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's some Demo the, the Democrats we're getting to know. We mm -hmm. know most of these people because they are in the House of Representatives already right. here. Uh, but there's going to be some really interesting things on the Republican side. Right. We're <laughs> hearing that Dick Brubaker former state senator, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. is going to run. And Susan, uh, Dick can finance his own campaign. Yes, you know, he, he, he has a, made a lot of money in the car business, and, and his grandfather started the big car business there. <coughs> um, he And talk about name recognition. Dick Brubaker has got pretty big name recognition when it comes to that area yeah. down there. Having yeah. had the long family history there, having, you know, the dealership there, yeah. and being, you know, a representative, I mean, yeah. a senator from there. So yeah, he's got a lot of neck, and he's not—he's not your super right winger type. He's more a bit of a moderate in areas as far as not being, you know, on the crazy train. Right, and 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 then you have Greg Albritton, who mm -hmm. is a state senator, current state senator, mm -hmm. who has the Porch Creek Indians behind him. That's right. big, right? Yeah. yeah. And he's down in that Mobile area, yeah, you know, is. around around in that area. So uh, so. I, those two, if they decide to get in, will be formidable candidates. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any doubt about it. They do have the kind of appeal that I think people are looking for mm -hmm. if they're going to vote for a Republican. We also have a new person who's who's jumped in, and that is uh, Carolina Dobson, mm -hmm. and she is an attorney. She's a Harvard graduate. Uh, she also went to Baylor yes. Law. Uh, comes from a fairly wealthy family, and her husband does as well. So she can self-fund. I'm afraid, at least from her initial press release, that she's going to be far right for that district. I think she's going to be <clears throat> with the things that she's talking about, like, you know, family, work, faith, all being, you know, still a part of her <sighs> election. That's boring. Like, it come on. I've, I've seen a thousand of her. That's what like the, 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 the Does she think that's going to work? <laughs> I, I don't know, but a lot of the radicals or, you know, far right wingers come out with that as their first salvo is what they say. And then they have to get into the red meat part of it. And I'll, I think that might work in the primary, but I don't think it will carry in the general. You know, I was talking to some folks that, that met her last week, you know, and said that she was a super smart woman, really personable. Uh, you know, she lives in old Cloverdale, so that's, yeah. that's money, baby. Uh, but the problem was they said... She didn't work the room. There was no retail politics. There. Yeah, you you have to you have to have the personality. I mean, if if that's not there, if you can't get like a, just a small group of people to care that you're in the room, you're you probably shouldn't be running. And she has no name recognition. Right. So if she's not working the room, that's gonna you know everywhere she goes. I keep having to look back down because I keep forgetting her name. Yeah, <laughs> but you know if she's not working the room, how's she gonna get you know some name recognition and some spot on? Uh, conversations with people yeah. about what she actually wants to do. Well, somebody said that she, she was smart, and they said, you know, like Katie Britt's smart. And I said, oh, hey, no, no, no. Hey, no. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, 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 uh. And Katie Britt wants the room there. wherever she is, if it's in a coffee shop. That woman lights up a room like she's the sun. She, she does. Right. And sincerely works the room. She, she loves she people. All right. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back. home is your most valuable asset. But what if someone tried to steal it from you? Property fraud is one of the fastest growing areas of fraud in the country today. As a district attorney, I've seen firsthand the devastating effects of property fraud. That's why I'm proud to support the Montgomery County Probate Court's REACT program. REACT is designed to protect your property and to give you peace of mind. By signing up, you'll receive an email notification if a document is filed against your property. This program is a game changer. It has the potential to prevent fraud and protect countless homeowners throughout Montgomery County. So don't wait. Sign up for REACT today and protect your home. Protect your home with REACT. Sign up today. There seems to be a new wave of aggressive driving lately. You see those people, they are the ones that are tailgating other people because they have to get to their destination now. Weaving in and out of traffic, looks like they 
could care less about who's around them. There's no one else on the roadway. They're the only one there. Aggressive driving can be the difference between life and death. All because somebody thought they needed to be the front of the line and get there first. Slow down. Don't be the reason that someone else doesn't go home tonight. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Susan, uh, Nancy Peck, or Pack, the director of the library services here in Alabama, mm -hmm. announced last week that Alabama would be leaving the American Library Association. The American Library Association is the oldest library association. It's the biggest in the world, and we're pulling out because someone decided that they're too woke, right? They're just, they're too woke because they think that there should be access to books mm -hmm. in live, in public libraries. Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, imagine that. And the, the, the far right wing of the Republican party here has decided that it's more important to keep children ignorant and, you know, ignorant of the facts of life and the history of our state mm -hmm. and the history of the country is more important than it is to have this big association help our libraries. I mean, just in the past few years, they've given about $300,000 to public libraries in Alabama. That's all going to be gone. It's all going to be gone. Uh, I think they might even move on to erasing Nazi history in, in, in our books and stuff so that they don't real people don't realize if they're not taught about Nazism, they don't realize what these people are actually trying to repeat history again and banning books in libraries and, and moving them is just there's some say that's not censorship, but it is. It's absolutely censorship. And the first thing my mind went to with it was I immediately thought of the students that rely on the scholarships that the ALA uh, it has available. Like, like I went to school with so many students who would not have even been able to attend college if not for scholarships. Maybe not from ALA, but just the fact that scholarships in general, Alabama students need those so much. And to throw that away, uh, like throw some opportunities away for our students over such a petty argument is just, that, that just proves there's a much bigger problem. Well, and I don't really think Pat wanted to do this, but no. she was pressured by high level Republicans, one of them is the governor, governor uh, to be able to do this. Now, I understand that individual libraries may be able to stay in the they ALA, can. but why would they risk, you she's, know, uh, being having their funds cut as a result of doing that? She's still guilty by association. Well, I mean, listen, she caved. Let's mm -hmm. just be honest. She caved we, because she's a, they, they, they get afraid of losing their mm -hmm. job because these people will go after their jobs. Yes, they will. And mm -hmm. that's what's happened here. But the thing is, and this is really what's shocking you know, libraries are still a precious commodity. They are not, books are not rare anymore. We don't really have to collect them in libraries, but there are people that need the public library, mm -hmm. not just for books, but for writing resumes and using the computer and using this. And community organizations have come together to at libraries. And Charlie, one of the things we've seen is that every place where these these crazy people have tried to shut down the library books. The community has come together. Because they realize that the, the community actually needs that and that scares them. They, they care so much about it, they want to fight for it. The community does. Right. So the people that hate it, for some reason in their warped brains, hate the fact that these people care so much about this cause that they genuinely should care about and don't care about their backwards hillbilly ways of thinking, that they're showing out in the most nasty ways possible. 88% 80, of Americans, and, and, and the latest numbers are 88% of Americans uh, oppose book banning. Yeah. But yet these very small group of people are being able to go in and bully yeah. uh, these libraries and, and, and uh, try to get their way with it. I'm just saying it's, it's just because ridiculous. some of these people that hate it, like whether it be a spouse or someone, they have someone in a position of power 
whether it just be on a very local level or maybe a, a little bit higher level where they're able to, I guess, gather a following and maybe have the funds to do these outrageous things. But in, in, in places like Ozark, for instance, they even censored, censored the mayor. Know, because when the, when oh. the community started moving, and in Huntsville too, when the community started moving, it stopped. It stopped. Mm -hmm. And and again, I'm afraid that uh, you're going to have groups like the Alabama Policy Institute mm -hmm. and folks like that coming out and targeting lawmakers who do not support this radical agenda of banning books they claim is not banning, it's censoring books. And that's, that's the all it same is. thing. No, it is, it is. <laughs> you, but I guarantee you, you're going to see this in legislation in the 2024 session. Yeah. Oh, there absolutely. is no doubt this oh, is gosh. coming. Yeah. And you know, the thing that people do not realize, that in Alabama, it was black people before 1960 mm -hmm. could not use the public libraries right. that their tax dollars paid for. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so they got up and they protested and did sit-ins and read-ins so that people would understand that black individuals had the right to public libraries just like white people. They deserve right. to be there too. Yeah. And, like, and what needs to happen is they need to do sit-ins and write-ins and, and the legislature I mean, it worked there, in the session. past. It, if, hey. if you really care about the libraries, you need to get focused and get groups together to go to Montgomery and to stop this nonsense. Listen, what, the, what do they want to ban? Books on race, mm -hmm. books on racism, books on sexuality, and books on gender. Mm -hmm. They want to segregate the libraries mm -hmm. so that these people that want to learn about that can't learn about and it. And also pieces of history that they want us to forget. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Can't have that either. And, and this is so un-American. I mean, it's just not even, I can't even fathom that in 2023, you have a group of people mm -hmm. that are so narrow-minded that they think that we our kids can't handle books. I mean, Charlie, they talk about they don't want to expose teens to the fact that they're gay teens or, or <laughs> transsexual teens. I mean, I'm just saying I read a lot of crazy books when I was a kid, but I'm, I didn't turn out trans and I'm not a psychopath. So I really don't see what their issue is. Like, <laughs> well, you know, I think that maybe something in their closet they're worried about. More it than is. Like, and there's it nothing is. wrong and with turning out trans. And if you talk to teenagers <laughs> about, you know, gay teenagers, you know, try to explain it to them. They'll laugh at you because they know four or five yeah, exactly. already. It's right. not, this is not something new. Again, this is a wedge issue in the culture wars. Mm -hmm. And as I've said a hundred times, not every culture war ends in a shooting war, but every shooting war begins with a culture war. And we, the country is being torn apart by these divisive groups that want to divide us. Because they can't come up with ideas of how to improve the state. So they've got to be yelling all the time. And that's all we're getting is yelling. Like, you know, Josh said last week, we've got teen pregnancy problems. We've got, you know, STD <coughs> problems young, among young people. They need to read these books. When one of the Thank things you. when we were talking about the candidates, right? One of the things that every one of those Democrats has been able to do is work across the aisle mm -hmm. with Republicans. Because... We have people in Alabama that do want to get things done, both Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. We need that in D.C. Let's hope we get somebody good. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back. As a paramedic, you wouldn't believe the things that we've seen. I've seen all types of horrible things. I mean, we're there basically picking up the pieces from your worst day. Everyone is just driving and not paying attention. We all have the same goal. All of us want to go home alive and safe and harm nobody else in the process. Slow down, be careful, care about the other people on the road. Don't be the reason that someone else doesn't go home tonight. Today, Montgomery is a safer city. It's time to shift the narrative and take control of our future. We're reopening community centers, remediating blight, and revitalizing neighborhoods across the city. And we're unleashing new opportunities. Over the past year, companies have invested a record-setting $2 billion in Montgomery and created 2,000 jobs. This is a new Montgomery. And together, we're reimagining the possibilities.
Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. The Alabama Medical Cannabis Commission cannot get their act together. It's a joke. To save their lives. I mean, they have just tested the patience of Montgomery Circuit Court Judge James Anderson mm -hmm. time and time and time again. They seem to be close, Susan, to working this out. But you know what? I, I, I hate to say it. They're going to have to do more. And one of the things they're going to have to do is they're going to have to get rid of this flawed scoring mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. because it's just going to stay one legal battle after the other because, I mean, it was so bad that one group would, I mean, just tell us how bad it was. Oh, it's so bad that, you know, ASU is involved with uh, Hornet Medicinals, yeah. right? Now, they did not score high on minority status. They did not score high on them actually being in the state, even though the university's been here for a hundred, you know, well over a hundred years. Uh, they scored poorly in those two. Then you had one one uh, uh, company that for one score on their security, they scored like in the 30s, and the other ones they scored it as like 300. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all over the place. And they're not willing, the problem right now is they're not willing to get rid of these scores and make it a level playing field. And this, 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 and I, I'm sorry, Troy, this is not an issue that was mandated by law. No. I mean, it's just, Charlie, they must be smoking their own supply, right? I did have that in mind, <laughs> yes. But just like the numbers aside, just in general, I don't understand how so many states have been able to successfully enact medical cannabis, and then there's us. <laughs> Why are we dumb? What happened? <laughs> well, it's not only that. They have not toured the facilities. Right. They have not talked with upper management of any of these companies. I mean, that's like... Step one yeah. of doing any of this, I mean, they, but they're wanting to rely on these scores when nobody's actually been there to see how do you how do you rank the security of a facility if you haven't actually been there? Are yeah. you doing it off a blueprint? That's exactly what they're I mean, trying to do. But if it's it, it can be on the blueprint, blueprint, but not even installed at the right. facility. I like mean, I understand this was maybe a surprise when it was initially passed, and it, it, they, they and they already knew they were going to have a lot of work to do. They did. But I think with how many good examples of functioning. Me medical cannabis programs we have in this country, how is it so hard to find a solution and find a model and just freaking do it? <laughs> they, they, and they finally have decided how they're going to do it. And they are going to let the individual commissioners do what they were assigned to do. And that is them decide the scoring by going to the facilities, by meeting with the people by doing all the things that they have not done. That they aren't doing exactly. Right. Gotcha. But the, the thing that's standing in the way, and I guarantee you, Judge Anderson eventually will rule and tell them they can't use these flawed scores because mm -hmm. there's too many variations. I mean, you, you cannot say that uh, uh, one company has great security that doesn't even have a slab poured. They just have the thing. Right. And another company that's been in operation in another field for all this time and say, oh, well, their security is terrible. It's like, what are they doing instead of doing that? Just sitting around fumbling with numbers that aren't accurate? What they're doing is they've been listening to terrible lawyers for mm -hmm. the last couple of years that let them down a primrose path to destruction. And that's why we don't have medical cannabis today is because poor lawyering. And that's why Alabamians continue to suffer. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, th this is like she says, this is a problem for people who actually need the medical cannabis for them to be still fooling around with this and trying yeah. to be stubborn and all of that. You're actually hurting people doing this. Well, I think they need to understand that, again, this is the this is the last hurdle they have to overcome is these license and, and the licensing mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. is to do away with the scores and do it right and not rely on a bunch of outside consultants and many of them college students to decide who scored what 
on which part of this process. Y'all out here relying on college students. Oh my God, I didn't even know that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That is ridiculous. Well, they might be thinking that they're more prone to use the product, Charlie. I mean, they may be, but, oh, just, I can't. <laughs> we can't on that. That's, yeah. I, I do trust Judge Anderson's uh, uh, judgment on yeah. this, though. But he will, he's going to lose his patience, yeah. and I don't blame him. I would have already lost my patience with him a long time ago. Well, I, I just don't. Uh, they did I, it right the first time. There's no way this plays out well if they keep on with these flawed scores. Uh, Barry Moore. Uh, Representative Barry Moore was drawn out of his congressional district, District 2. Uh, but he has decided to run against Jerry Carl, who is the incumbent mm -hmm. in District 1. Uh, Barry Moore announced uh, that he's running. And uh, Representative Carl said, bring it on, brother. And it's going to be Republican battling Republican mm -hmm. for the first congressional district. And Susan... It's probably going to be a nasty fight because the Club for Growth is going to come in here and try to try to own Congressional mm -hmm. District 1 just like they own 2 when they had Barry Moore because they couldn't buy Jerry Carl. Right. Uh, they're going to come in here with a lot of money, uh, a whole lot of money for Barry Moore. But Jerry Carl is really strong in that district. He's got a great following. Uh, he's very popular. Uh, and so it's it's. It's going to be a fight because Barry Moore is not that popular. Not mm -hmm. even pop, very popular in D.C. Uh, but uh, Carl is more, he's not a moderate. He's a no. hardcore no. right-wing guy. But he's actually, I think, gets more done. The, 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 the main thing between them is Jerry is a direct man. Like, I've never, I feel like when he says he's going to do, I, and, when you want a candidate, don't you want the candidate that can't be bought by someone? Right. I feel like you could never trust Barry because everything he's bought and paid for, he, you know, they tell him what to say. Well, Club for Growth He is, doesn't have a brain to, to, to do it on Exactly. His own. He can't form it himself. I, I think it's going to be a tough race. It's going to be a nasty race. And, uh, you know, when you get incumbent against incumbent, Republican against incumbent, Republican, it never looks good. It always looks bad. And they're going to have to tear each other mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. to win that race down there. And I, I really feel, I feel it's a disservice to the people of that district. And I agree. But, mm -hmm. but, I agree. But, but Barry didn't want to give up. Just Barry that, being greedy. That's his choice. That's normal. Anyway, we're going to have to leave it right there. You've been watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. You watch us because we watch them. <laughs> <laughs>